I, like Francie, was born into a Republican household. I was born in the Ardoin area of Belfast, which I lived in for a very short period of time, and then moved from there to the Falls Road, Clamard, which is known as the Clamard. <coughs> um, the, my involvement with the Republican mo movement was, as a young boy, I went into the Fianna. As a child, and it was purely a a boy scout organisation in those days, like. and I went from that to the army at 16, like Francie, and uh, remained within the army up until the so-called peace process, as I see it. And um, like Francie and uh, all men of our era who were involved with uh, the Republican movement. Um, we were sort of, and particularly if you were the son of an Irish Republican, my father was a 40s man, 30s, 40s man. I've been in the prisons in the 40s before I was born. And if you were the child of uh, such a, a family, you were, in these areas, you were sort of an outcast. For the Second World War had just ended, and you were frowned upon. And, you were very much on your own. That was the environment of the time. Um, so I was very aware of the British occupation of this island um, through the stories of the fire side and through what I had experienced as a child during the 56th campaign, um, where there was constant raids at my home, where um, my father was on the run and uh, where the, where as, as all Republican homes, they are, they are doing here at that period, and there were very few, uh, was to get under the same sort of, getting the same treatment. Um, so it was nothing strange to me to find myself um, arrested on internment one, as much as I didn't want to be there, like, <laughs> but that happened, and there, there I was. Um, I was also always aware of the policy of the British concerning Irish Republicans, <coughs> the pris the, the, their prisoners. Irish Republican prisoners is an unwritten policy within the, the Northern Ireland Home Office, which is still the same today as it has been from the foundation of this state, was to f mentally and physically destroy Irish Republicans. Mm. That's its main objective. And um, that's what it, it, it works on and stresses on and to mentally and physically to destroy the Republican pure community. That's the people outside who support uh, national freedom. And, um, that's where it was. I found myself arrested on a time of morning. I was taken to Mocha Street Bike on the Government Road where I was simply tied like everyone else, like a chicken. Uh, physically thrown into the back of an army lorry and transported to Gerwood Bike. And on arriving in Gerwood Bike, um, I was kicked from the lorry, not lifted from it, literally kicked out under the grass and um, trailed to uh, the corridor uh, where we were then. The restraints were removed of us and we were taken into a, um, a gymnasium uh, where there was I don't know, two or three hundred men all sitting around on the floor of the gymnasium. And it was literally covered with um, military police and uh, RUC and British soldiers. Um, and we were told to sit down. There was a lane formed up. As men come in, we were told to sit in the lane. Everything was set out in the lane. And I was there for a period of about an hour, or thereabouts. And I was brought up to. Uh, there was uh, myself and another fella, a Belfast man from the district that I was <coughs> lived in, Clonner, a fella by the name of Michael Brown. And we were taken up <coughs> to an interrogation room. Uh, and and, and after it, there was two branch men on it. But we were taken in um, one at a time. The reason for that, when I went down, there was a, the desk was sat in an L shape. And there was a fella, and a branch man at the desk, 
and I, but Harry Taylor was sitting at the empty desk. Harry Taylor I had met on my first arrest, which was in uh, 60, it was during the Queen's visit, 64, 63, um, where th um, Thievel Barrick had, there'd been a bomb on in the Thievel Barrick, and um, I'd been arrested over this, this was my first arrest. <coughs> so, from that period, to that particular period, uh, of the um, I was well known to the branch in Belfast, and uh, Harry Taylor was notorious. Bastard. <laughs> he was uh, in charge of the special branch uh, in the Belfast area of that over uh, the North Grand. But anyway, um, I, he asked me that I knew why I was there. And I said, um, How would a Catholic be, how would a Catholic do for starting short? And he just, he was sitting with a fan, looking the fan. He gave the fan the, the, this. Um, Mulgrew Cap, who he called into the room and told me to take me away. He was taken back outside the door, Michael Brannan was brought in. And um, after when Michael came out, we were returned to the gymnasium. And whilst we were sitting in the gymnasium, um, I needed to, uh, to use the bathroom. I wanted to go for a leak. <laughs> so I says, well, I'll, I'll come to the toilet and this Mulgrew Cap. He, he come along and he says, uh, the two, there was two, they were, they were in two, these two were together, these two monthly caps. But one of them says to this monthly cap who was looking after me, if that's the way to put it, he says, Luke Corp, this is the, the other one, he said, Luke Corp, he says, this is a wee mate of mine from the big smoke. That was my, Mickey Brown. And then he come to me and, uh, and this other cop says I, that, that I was his, uh, I also was his mate from the big smoke. And young and all the rest of it, I said him I was no mate of his. So, and uh, I was then, uh, I went up to the toilet, I went into the toilet black. He, uh, he, he came in behind me and he there was a map, sitting on a map bucket. And he told me to clean the latrines. The, I had never heard that word before. Right? And it said about the intermediate school. I went to the intermediate school. <laughs> <laughs> I had never heard the word that you referred to. But I knew exactly what he meant. And I said to him, uh, I'm not, if, you want to clean the, if you want the toilets clean, clean them yourself. I'm not cleaning the toilets. And he started at the main me so I don't bother. And the other one came in and gave him a hand. And, uh, so they literally trailed me out there, pulled me out, because of the state I was in, back to where I was, and left me sitting. And a short time later, Mickey went up to the toilet and went through the same, the whole same process. So, and about an hour after that, I was, uh, I was six in the years called my, my, me and Michael Ram, I think it was two of the names it was called. The other people, um, Hatchet Kerr was one of them, I remember that. Maxie from the markets, from, I can't think of his name. Tony Maxwell. Tony Maxwell. Uh, I, don't, I can't remember the other two, but we, the six of us was taken <coughs> outside to a corridor. And um, we were literally dragged, punched, kicked, booted the whole way across to a chopper pod. And we were thrown into a chopper, um, and, and it was one of the the big Chinooks, the, the troop carrier, with a compression doors on. And after they got us in, they were literally stomping on us in the inside of it. The thing was off the ground, you see, and it it um, Hoover, I don't know how long it was hovering above the the ground, right? And it was moving back and forth as if it was in a full flight. <coughs> And there was a period of time passed, and all of a sudden, the the uh, compression doors opened, <coughs> and this mother cop put his foot to me and kicked me out the door. Well, prior to this, hey, before, before the troubles, I suppose, I had read about the Brit in Aden during the, 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 
the 60s, the, early, the middle of it, earlier the middle of the 60s, I'd been reading the paper and it was a constant, on the Sunday papers you got a, a write-up about the British in Eden. And the type of thing they were doing was political suspects then, they were arresting them, taking them up in choppers, taking them out to the sea, tying a rope to them and tying the rope to the chopper, <laughs> dropping them out of the chopper and dipping them in the middle of the sea water, you know. <clears throat> and um, so all these things, this was going through my head, like, not just as I come out of the chopper and down, <laughs> but uh, this was all, I was aware of all these things, and I was very much aware of what they were capable of. And because uh, I'd heard the stories of the 40 period and the 30 period and all the rest of it. And I owned it in the dog compound. And when I came into the dog compound, there was all season dogs on it. And I was set upon by dogs. <laughs> and uh, there was British soldiers there with uh, asbestos suits on them, like corky suits, but they were, uh, they were the dog handlers. And they trailed the dogs from me. And just one man after the other come down into this compound. And take them back out and put back into the chopper. And that's the way it went. And the chopper went up again. So this had happened a couple of times. And then I was taken from there to... After this was over, this end of it was over, we were taken out of the, out of the dog compound into this sort of runway, if you like. And it become known to us at a later stage as an obstacle course. And what had happened was, um, either on a tournament morning or shortly before, Gerwig Barrick backed on the Belfast prison. They had blown a hole in the wall of the prison. The, the mason wall was built sort of four foot thick. <coughs> um, for the gate to gain entry into the prison. And we were trailed, well I was trailed as the old world had come and we were into the prison then. Uh, that day, rather, um, by the ankles, across this, what become known as an obstacle course, consisted of bob wire, broken glass, etc. And I was battered, kicked, but <coughs> I mean, battered the whole way of it. And I can remember seeing the hole in the wall, but I must have been booted till it passed out or whatever. I don't remember going through the hole in the wall. But the next thing, I started to come around, I was being dragged down the prison yard. And I had been remanded in Belfast prison in the 60s for a period of time. And um, <coughs> I was aware that it was the prison I was in. Um, funny stuff, I was taken into D-Wing, which I didn't know at the time, and taken to D-3, and the cell door was opened. And I was just literally through into it. And I was at body battered, but hardly get off the, the floor. And as, as the door seemed to just have closed, it opened again. And there was a prisoner who had come in by the name of Sean McPhillips, who uh, <coughs> uh, pre the split. He was a member of the official IRA. Mm -hmm. I, at that stage of my life, was a member of the provisional IRA. And uh, although he, he couldn't, <coughs> there was no animosity or nothing, there were any problems that way. He'd done all he could do to you know, because my nose was busted, my teeth were doing my bottom lip, and that's the state I was in. And he tried to clean the blood off me and all the rest of it. Um, after a lengthy period of time there, uh, before dawn anyway, on the 10th morning, the doors opened, and it was the Brits, and I was battered again, and trailed the whole way back to Gerwood Bike, and arriving in the Gerwood Bike, um, I was, I seen in the hallway there was a crowd of people who I did, whenever I got in, I knew Francie, right, and I knew Joe Clark, um, and they were in the hallway, like myself, and uh, I was handcuffed to Francie, don't know who, the hood went over there, the hood, I <coughs> put a hood on in my head, on. I was handcuffed to Francie, um, and I don't know who the other man was, but I know she was Joe Clark, possibly Joe Clark. And <coughs> shortly after that, I was, we were trailed back outside, trailed across to the chopper, physically thrown into the chopper, two at a time or whatever way they could get us into it. 
stood on again, and I don't know how long we're in the air, to me, trying to estimate it, 40 minutes or thereabouts. I just honestly don't know. And the chopper landed. Trail from the chopper, I think at that stage, I'm not sure where the handcuffs were removed, but there was a batter and kicking match the whole way down to, uh, which, which uh, what I remember about it was a flight of stairs, it was trailed up like two or, not a flight, two or three steps, and we were swinging doors, remember we trailed in the end, and um, taken from that through an or set of mm -hmm. so many doors, I was coming shortly after, mm -hmm. and into this room, and put it, placed again a wall with this hood, no, sorry, the ones the Marigo was before. Mm -hmm. I was in this corridor, along with other men, and this boy come along, and he's an Englishman, and he said he was a doctor. <coughs> and, uh, he sounded me, as he was doing, what, as he had done with other men. And he asked me if I had a heart problem. <laughs> and I said that I had, that I hadn't heard of it, which I had. I'd been born with it, and I've lived with it all my life. But that was it. It made no difference at all, like, you know, one way or the other, but that <coughs> problem. Uh, I was saying, I was saying, my clothes were forcibly taken from me, and I was put into a set of overalls, green army overalls, which was, thank God, um, five, six sizes too big. Some of so the boys could say it. Five or six inches smaller. Last in disguise, the eyes was <coughs> too big, and I was trailed into this room. And I was with well, this room. This room was on my head, and was screwed up at the back. There was no air that you couldn't sort of get it off here. It was tied, I think, at the back. You know, it was double lined. There was a pole string at the back of it, and I was put putting in this wall on a spread eagle position. And there was finger tips and tiptoes. Finger tips again the wall and tiptoes, your feet off the ground. And um, it was just a merciful noise. And I, we all, the hood of men went through that, we all the only have to scrape. And to me it was like a, mm -hmm. you know, a, the engine of an aircraft, a jet like, and it was multiplied, I don't know, 30, 40 times. It was just a merciful noise. The longer you were there, and the longer it went on, the more sort of squealing it seemed to get mm -hmm. into your head. And uh, if you leaned, after a period of time against the wall, <coughs> you know, if your arms went down again, it, or if you went down again, it, you were battered in the ribs, you were battered in the back, it was a free for all. Uh, not that you could see anything, but if you got a, you were sort of, it was just a pattern match. And this went on, on, continuously. Didn't, I don't know, you know, the sort of, you know, in the hours, and then it went on endless. And uh, the only difference between the wall, uh, every time there was a melee at the wall, if I, in my case, I had, uh, I think it happened a few of the oil lots too, I come round, I must have been bitched unconscious. And I come round handcuffed to an old steel radiator. One of the old ones you had to get in the schools when there was a lot of people here, young like me, they put the rib out. Old cast iron or a foot, a foot yeah. depth and they were doubled. Handcuffed the one I am on the floor. And uh, and as soon as you went to remove this bloody out of your head, there would have come th three or four bodies in a tabby. And it was a batter and match, and the cuffs were taken off, and you were taken back out to the wall, putting in the wall. And the only other time that you were taken <coughs> to the wall, you were taken to this room, <coughs> very easy. It was like a scene from the, the, scene the, uh, from the, the Gestapo. You were uh, taken into a room, pulled into a wooden chair. Your, your two hands was forced round your back. And uh, cough play, and the, somebody would have got the hold of your neck like this with their arm around your neck, and that's shit here. Yeah. Just yeah. tell them about it. <laughs> 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 yeah, there was a knee 